Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the moon. I'm your host for this evening, Lawrence Ray. And today I'm joined by my esteemed co-host, Ricardo Martinez and Jerry. But more importantly, uh, today we are interviewing the fantastic Adam Gibson, one of the geniuses behind uh, Join Market, uh, working with CoinJoin and privacy-based uh, Bitcoin implementations. Uh, how are you doing today, sir? Are you, is that me? You're calling me sir? That, that's, that's, that is you, yes. <laughs> sir, sir is not a required... Uh... Monica. Um, no, so uh, I'm, I'm great. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It's uh, always fun. Chat Bitcoin. Yeah, I guess I'll crack on. Just start us off with, uh, with a question um, about yourself, uh, about, I guess, kind of <clears> like, uh, well, I was thinking kind of, I, I used to kind of go to more, towards the beginning of the Bitcoin journey. So hmm. I understand uh, from listening to some podcasts you're in and uh, researching yourself, uh, you were a nuclear engineer at one point. Um, I was, yeah. And, yeah, you taught in China as well. So like two mm -hmm. quite sort of interesting things from the get-go, really, uh, to <laughs> me at least. Um, I guess my first question, and the reason for me asking this makes sense further on, is what was it like being in China when you were there? Because as someone who's lived there, mm. uh, from like your experiences with the culture and the government, uh, mm. I guess that may give you some kind of understanding of this sort of Bitcoin ban that they're doing and, and, and the motives mm. and where mm. that might be going. So I guess I was, I was interested yeah. to see what that might be. Yeah, I mean, I would only be opinion, of course. I mean, by the time I left, which was around the same time I got interested in Bitcoin, um, I remember having some quite amusing conversations with, with people there uh, in early 2013. Like, um, I'll always vividly remember, like, uh, speaking to a work colleague about Bitcoin. He was kind of interested, but he said, look, he said, look Adam, I'm, I, this is really pretty interesting, but I've got to be honest, I just think it's too expensive. <laughs> and it was like 700 RMB or about, you know, 60 or $70 a coin or whatever it is, you know, $100 a coin. Um, but yeah, about this whole kind of culture and like how it plays into, you know, are they banning it? Are they not banning it? How do they look on mining? Um, I mean, there's many elements to it. I mean, the first point is that the sort of Bitcoin philosophy didn't resonate very easily with people in that part of the world, at least if you're talking like in the most generic way, because culturally there's a very strong tendency towards, you know, putting the group above the individual. And so there's always a tendency to think in terms of hierarchical structures. That's true everywhere in the world, but it's 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 just that little bit more true in Asia uh, and, and China is probably a predominant example of that. So there's a lot of, you know, the idea of a, of, a, of a technology or a system that doesn't have a leader is is really doesn't it doesn't sit easily. <laughs> uh, that doesn't mean there aren't they aren't open minded and there's plenty of open minded people, but it, it's just it was it was a little bit more difficult. But there is a strong kind of gambling culture there. I want to say so that's a little bit sort of pejorative, but um, investments are uh, there's there's a kind of investment crazes in China are a big thing they they have been for I don't know how far back that goes but certainly as far back as I was there which I first went there in 2004 or 5 time and um you know sometimes they, 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 they'll be like a whole 6 month period where every everyone's investing in oolong tea or everyone's investing in this you know like copper or I, various kinds of metals or something and 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 part of it is because like there's a kind of financial suppression there there, there are some academics who've looked into this and um you know during the whole period of china's economic rise it was it was a very difficult thing for the the middle and lower classes because all they really could do is put their money in the bank where it was being paid interest which was significantly lower than inflation um so there was this kind of financial repression and you know they could just like oh i'll just open up a retail brokerage account and invest in the s p 500 you, you can't do that you know so it's a very complicated story um so there's that and then in the, the whole thing about like bitcoin not being something that follows the normal process of having a control having a hierarchy having someone you can talk to is it was a real like problem for the ccp because they they're, they're obsessed with with keeping power first and foremost, and and part of that is controlling the narrative about everything, including things like investments. You know, all the ups and downs of the stock market. Uh, a lot of them are driven by the CCP's decisions, and um, and so having something they couldn't really easily control was really hard. And and I think a lot of what you saw in the early years of Bitcoin with them kind of like vacillating a bit, like there'd there'd be a news story come out would say something nice about it, and then later on they'd be oh this is a terrible idea, don't you? But, I think people at the higher ends of the hierarchy in China didn't 
really know how to deal with this. I'm sure a lot of them just ignored it. Other, others thought it was stupid. But they, to the extent that they took it seriously, they were like, what the heck do we do about this? And so in the end, they only did the same kind of thing as they did, for example, with the the peer-to-peer -peer lending um, phenomenon that, that th was sort of grew up in, I think, 2016 to 2018 period in China, which is like, we just try and crack down. We try our best to crack down. And we just, eventually, they sort of got their, their, their minds around it, uh, you know, within the last year or two. And like, they started cracking down on exchanges. Then it was, you know, then it was cracking down on mining. And they, they'll, just, they'll just do their best to make it so that, think about the internet itself, right? Chinese people, in theory, have access to the internet and can read all the same things freely as we can, but in practice they can't because the, the crackdowns are kind of effective on a, on a social level. It's all through society. It's one of those things with China. Um, I suppose another potential motive of theirs could be this kind of digital yuan, um, sort of CBC mm. kind of style mm. coin that they have coming as well. And, and I know a lot of governments around the world are looking at CBDCs and trying to sort of always threaten the stable coin uh, environment mm. as a result. Um, but I guess um, to move away from well, CBDCs and stable coins and more more kind of uh, Bitcoin oriented, I suppose, in, in discussion. Because uh, obviously one thing that I can see from your current work and your involvements is that you're a privacy conscious guy, a privacy focused mm. guy with what you do. Mm. Um, and obviously, you know, China is not the most privacy. <laughs> it's a bit more Orwellian almost in, in a sense, mm. in the way that the government runs things. And it's kind of a, a very sort of stark contrast, I suppose, in a way to that. Um, so I guess I wondered, like, before you got involved in Bitcoin and in your current work, like, yeah. was privacy very much like a focus for you, like, for, for a long time in your life? Or, or was that something that more kind of hmm. came about with Bitcoin? If you go, hmm. was it a pre-Bitcoin yeah. pre thing or not? Yeah, I appreciate the question. I, I, mean, I mean, the short answer is it's, it, it starts with Bitcoin, really, because, um, but also, I mean, the sort of motivating forces to me to get interested in Bitcoin, I wouldn't say they were actually related to privacy i'd say they were more related to independence and autonomy you know like um the experience something you experience a lot if you do spend time living in other countries is the difficulty of dealing with banks and of course there's, there's a vast array of that kind of difficulty i mean if we're talking about nigeria for example right <laughs> that's pretty serious there's a lot of problems in africa dealing with banks i know uh, not from personal experience from what people have told me and uh, but even if you say, you know, you, English, you might think some people in the world might think, oh, English people, it's easy. You know, banks, they don't give, cause you any problems. But, you know, you try living in one country and being like a citizen in a, in a second and, you know, working in a third and, and, you know, resident in one, having your bank in another one and then going on a holiday in a fifth one or sixth one or whatever it is. I mean, the, the, the layers and layers of problems. And one thing I noticed coming back to England after spending a long time abroad is that like the layers and layers of bureaucracy in every kind of payment and every kind of like service, you, it's, it's, it's awful. Uh, it's, it's like you can't win. You either, you're either in a very sophisticated place and then you've got to fill out 55 different forms. But obviously, it's online nowadays. But, you know, phone these different people. And like if you have one T with it, not I not dotted or whatever in some particular thing, then the service doesn't get provided. So that's the kind of one extreme. And then the other extreme is, you know, you go to a third world country and, and like banks just won't deal with you or, or, or like to send a wire transfer. You have to, you have to like throw away half the money and wait seven weeks. Um, and all of these sort of in, in interferences were something that kind of made me more open-minded to the idea of a system, no, no matter how radical and no matter how superficially ridiculous, because, you know, I think people sometimes forget how ridiculous Bitcoin is as a concept. <laughs> because well, what do I mean by that? Because if you actually read the white paper, you say, wait, hang on, you're going to have a database and every single person using the database is going to hold the whole database in real time? Are you mad? <laughs> and of course, it is ridiculous. And, and I would say that like 90% of engineers that looked at it, maybe 99% just said this just obviously doesn't work. Um, but the people who maybe took it a bit more seriously, either, you know, it was Hal Finney because A is a genius and B was looking into this for years, or it's because, you know, they're open-minded to actually we do need something that no matter how extreme has this property of not depending on a, on, on these sort of, uh, you know, structures. Yeah.
What, what, what was the start of that conversation? I've forgotten what I was talking about. <laughs> no, you're all good. It was just, it was more so sort of like whether, I think you answered it, like whether your privacy consciousness oh, yeah, privacy, yeah. predated or, or not really. You know, I don't think so. And I, I don't think I'm more uh, privacy conscious than the average person. But when you start getting into Bitcoin, then you start, I mean, in my case, that meant getting into cryptography as well, because I, I just, it's just my nature is I'm just going to go into the, the bottom layer of it and actually try at least to understand it properly. And then I got really fascinated by all the cryptography that surrounds it. And then you start sort of studying. I remember like spending, maybe it was 2013 or 14, I spent like a month or two actually going through these challenges. They're called the Matasano challenges, or they were at the time anyway. And it's like you go through every like different way that cryptography is used in, in actual real systems and you just slowly build it up. And you realize that you, you have to have this paranoid mindset. There's all these different ways that things can be attacked. And, you know, trying to defend privacy is very, very difficult, uh, just in the sense of, like, trying to encrypt data. There are so many ways you can screw up doing that. Uh, and then as you as you start using Bitcoin, you see, you know, all the limitations and all the difficulties of trying to um, trying to have a reasonable level. So, so, so I see, in other words, I see it more as, like, I, I, I have a reasonable level of privacy. And I think most people think they have, but probably they don't think about it too much. I'm not super paranoid about nobody knowing anything about me. I just have like a normal level of privacy. But trying to match that either to modern IT systems in the in the normal world or to Bitcoin is extremely hard because just by default, you have so little privacy. I just wanted to ask, if, if you weren't that privacy conscious, how did you hmm. first get involved with Join Market? Yeah. So as I said, it was like the, tra the transition was more like, oh, I'm interested in like independence uh, forms of money. And in I'm interested in open source. I'm interested in decentralization. And then we go through the whole Bitcoin thing. And then it more comes out of that. Like the, the, the arrow to me is more like, you know, coming into Bitcoin via some general philosophical ideas than from Bitcoin going to cryptography, which is that's the step that a lot of people don't go because, you know, a lot of people don't have math degrees or, or, or are interested in those very sort of technical things. So they don't tend to go into the cryptography direction. But I did. And in parallel to that, like looking at these new ways of using Bitcoin that are kind of leveraging the cryptographic techniques, whether it be coin swaps or coin joins or stuff, got very interested in that multi-sigs as well back in 2014. Uh, Chris Belcher, I sort of met him at that time because we were both like investigating multi-sig, coin join, coin swap. We were fascinated by these things. And so it's like from there, realizing that Bitcoin is difficult to use privately and that privacy slash fungibility, you know, you could debate about the relative meanings of the two terms, are a crucial part of Bitcoin success as eventually, we hope, a, a big scale medium exchange. Um, it led me into that direction because it was a combination of seeing that that was needed and thinking that was an area I could contribute to. Because obviously there's a ton of things that are needed. I can't, I don't necessarily have the right skill set for all of them. So it's not so much that I came in, oh, I'm the privacy guy. What should I do in this and be the privacy guy? I, I, no, privacy is just like one of the things that this needs to me. You're being like a sort of final final piece to a puzzle, I guess, or, or a piece into the puzzle that's piece, needed yeah. to, to create it. Yeah, I understand that. I suppose one thing, um, I guess, on the on the privacy topic um, hmm. is, uh, well, we've we've had uh, Ricardo Spagni, Fluffy Pani on, on the show. Yeah. Uh, and we've had it was Giacomo Zucco, I believe, who mm -hmm. had quite an opposing opinion. So, so obviously, mm -hmm. Fluffy Pani, obviously, as a, a Monero lead maintainer, he, he's mm -hmm. pretty pro the idea of privacy baked in on the, mm -hmm. on, the mm -hmm. on the blockchain, essentially, on the, on the base yeah. layer. Uh, and Giacomo, I, again, it could be wrong here, but I think it was Giacomo who essentially was saying that he felt that privacy shouldn't really necessarily be well, mm. you know, it shouldn't sort of be uh, over. Essentially, what I think what he was trying to get at was that the base layer should be kept quite straightforward, and then, mm. Mm. like with internet, uh, the internet, mm. and then everything's baked on top on different yeah. layers. Um, and I didn't know kind of where you sat, where you sat with your personal views on that kind of not argument, but just on that kind of uh, idea as to whether everything should be baked in at the at the base layer, or whether you're more of a kind of in agreement with the whole like layers this, this argument that essentially actually the base layer should be quite straightforward, quite simple and quite clutter-free, and actually everything else should be kind of laid on top in order to uh, take advantage in the best way. Yeah, so I, I almost want to, it's probably annoying when people say this in podcasts and interviews, but I, I always want to refer you to what I said in in a, in a, in a panel back in, in Lisbon in 2018, because I think, I, 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 I'm still proud of this. It's probably quite silly to be proud of such a thing, but it was like mid-2018, if I got my timeline right, and I've said that the problem with, you know, systems like Monero and Zcash is that you can have bugs which aren't really like just crappy code bugs and they aren't really like 
oh, the system's entirely broken, but they're sort of somewhere in between, you know, somewhere in between like the academic and the code that people actually run. Something can go wrong. And the problem with systems like Zcash is because of the obfuscation, um, it means that nobody can know that something has gone wrong. And, um, you know, the the reason I'm saying, I'm proud of saying that is because about six months later, it turned out that Zcash, that exact thing had happened in Zcash six months before I'd said it. It happened like a year before they announced it, which is kind of amazing that they took a year before they decided to uh, spread this information to the world. Um, something like that anyway. Um, and, but the, you know, the other thing I remember, I remember that, 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 that chat we had on that panel. Cause one of the other things I said was like, the problem here is that like it's the absolute fundamental principle of a blockchain, like the DNA of a blockchain is public verifiability. Um, and, you know, it's easy for an academic cryptographer to just to say, scoff at my point of view and say, oh, doesn't matter. You know, we, this is mathematically sound. You know, for example, a, a crude example is well, not crude, but a typical example is confidential transactions where, you know, you use actual mathematics to prove that, that, that the sums add up, even though you can't see the numbers. Right. And that's that's true. So you can say, oh, so this is still publicly verified, right? But it's, it's subtly or maybe not subtly different between an absolutely plain uh, base layer and um, and uh, one which is still verifiable, but under certain assumptions. People often like jump into the whole quantum computing debate at this point. They start saying, oh, uh, you know, we, we have to worry about whether... You know, they worry about something like confidential transactions based on the fact that it uses Pedersen commitments and Pedersen commitments rely on the elliptic curve discrete logarithm problem. The elliptic curve discrete logarithm problem assumes there's no quantum computers. And you know, they get into this kind of old technical debate. And I think people sort of fetishize too much to like these exact mathematical facts, whereas the real world is very messy. So it's to me, it's more that the, the concern is more like what's this gap that we have between our eyes that we can verify directly something and you know, these base level assumptions. And like in the case of that Zcash problem, it was it was simply a matter of just making a slight error in like writing out a transcript, like the one particular entry in a transcript that shouldn't have been written out, that was written out. It's, you know, it's just some weird thing that maybe like 50 people in the world know about or care about. And just because one of them happened to make a mistake, the whole system was like completely screwed. So I think, although intuitively, and, you know, Fluffy Pony's been making that argument for I don't know how many years. And, and, and all the people in his camp is like, if it's not baked into the base layer, it doesn't work. Um, you know, you can build, uh, it's like that thing, you can, you can build a censorship resist, uh, you can't build a censorship resistant layer on top of a non-censorship resistant layer. And I think they try to make the same argument with privacy, and I'm not really sure it's true. And, I, and I've also made the analogy that you made which is, you know, look at how it worked in the real world with uh, with the internet. It, we had TCIP. It was, you know, crappy in many ways. And one way it's crappy is it's completely plain text. Arguably, is it? I don't know. And then we built, you know, SSL version one on it. That was crap. But then they built SSL version two, and eventually they built TLS, and TLS was actually good enough to the point where we now have kind of reasonable, reasonable certainty of, of the basic operation of it. So it might seem like superficially this is the wrong thing to have a plain text base layer, but both from the point of view of scalability and also from the point of view of verifiability, there is an argument that says actually the base layer needs to be super, super simple. It's it's arguable. It's arguable. So you've asked like one of the biggest questions in, in Bitcoin and, and the whole of cryptocurrency. So I, if, excuse me for answering rather long. <laughs> no, you're fine. I, I appreciate the answer. And um, yeah, I guess to be fair, it's something that neither uh, Ricardo or, or Jack, again, it could be Giacomo. I think it was Giacomo. Uh, Probably mentioned. was, yeah. Yeah, I think it was. Um, but I, yeah, it's just, yeah, never got, I've not got the best of memories. So uh, yeah, it was, um, yeah, I guess it's, yeah, you kind of raised a point that I guess, uh, they didn't necessarily mention, which was very obviously, I suppose, that, you know, if you can't see what's happening on the blockchain, mm. then there are potential issues. And then, as you said, with Zcash, exactly that did happen and yeah, did it get did get exposed too. after you said it, which is quite interesting, actually. Mm. Uh, I guess that's something I hadn't really, I guess I hadn't really obviously considered, I suppose, uh, which is a good point. I mean, Monero had a couple of bugs, but uh, I, uh, one of them didn't actually make it to mainnet. So that was a, that was a lucky, because uh, Jonas Nick uh, found it. Another one, I mean, I don't know, maybe they tell me that that didn't matter. The other one, it, it did make it to mainnet, and it was like based on um, 
based on a small subgroup attack. I mean, nobody cares the details, but the, the point is it wasn't, in a way, it wasn't really the huge catastrophic fail that, that Zcash had because the real nightmare scenario is when you have a bug that can allow inflation, infinite or finite, it doesn't really matter, but it's generally going to be infinite if it, if it happens without anybody noticing. And in, in that case, it wouldn't have been without anybody noticing. So it wasn't nearly as bad. But the, the, the principle still stands that, I mean, look, it's very debatable. I would say, like, you ask nine out of ten professional cryptographers, professionals in the, in the field will will probably disagree with me and say, you know what, you know, yes, systems are difficult to get right, but we can get them right. We can build them with proofs such that, you know, we know, we have assurance that actually you're not going to lose this stuff. But I, I can tell you one little sort of dirty secret, having, having spent quite a bit of time reading Cryptograph, uh, crypt cryptography papers is um, a lot of the time I can't understand the detailed security proofs. They're, they're very difficult, some of them. But in the cases where I did understand them, I think I've got a hit rate of something like two out of five where I found errors in the security proofs, which I told the authors and they said, yeah, that's that's actually an error. Uh, so yeah, I'm just saying like, a crypto this, you know, the quality of certainty we have in cryptography is sometimes overestimated because it seems like this magic and there's all these gray beards and they know everything but there's a lot of like there's a lot of uncertainty <laughs> i think